Hello, and welcome to another segment of the Geology One Processes and Products Lab DVD. Today we're going to talk about minerals. My name is Renee Clary, and I'll be your instructor for this segment. Why do we even bother to talk about minerals? Well, if you look at geology as a science, we generally talk about having three themes in geology. One is plate tectonics, one is the rock cycle, and one is the age of the earth, 4.6 billion years, and all the processes which have transformed or changed the earth during those 4.6 billion years. When we look at the rock cycle, however, we have to look at minerals, and that's because rocks are made of minerals. If you look at the slide, you'll notice that granite, which is a rock, it is the most common intrusive igneous rock, and we'll talk about that more in igneous rocks. This granite is made of quartz. You can see quartz as the, uh, the dark gray spots, the hornblende, the black mineral, and the potassium feldspar, which is the pink mineral. So rocks are made of minerals. In order to study rocks, we have to first study minerals. So, what makes a mineral a mineral? In order to be classified as a mineral, the substance must have very definite characteristics. First of all, it must be inorganic. That means that it could never have been living. We run into some rocks, such as fossiliferous limestone, that do have fossil shells in them, or coquina, which is made of cemented pieces of fossil shells. Coal, made of the remains of plants and animals that lived a long time ago. None of these rocks are composed of minerals, because minerals have to be organic and never have been living. Another characteristic of a mineral is that it is naturally occurring. We have the capabilities now in our society to create some gemstones in the lab. We can lab create sapphires and rubies and diamonds that have the same crystalline structure, the same chemical composition as those found in nature. However, by our very strict definition of a mineral, none of these lab created gemstones would qualify as a mineral. Minerals also have to be solid. Remember those old thermometers that you have to shake down? The ones with the silver mercury in the bottom? Mercury is an element on the periodic table. It is a metal, but it is unusual in that it is a liquid metal at room temperature. By our strict definition of a mineral, mercury is a liquid, would not be considered a mineral. Minerals also have to be crystalline. Now, there's a difference between having a crystalline composition and having a crystal form. Minerals very rarely occur in crystal forms where we have nice, beautiful crystals. For example, let's look at this one. This is a very well-formed crystal, a single crystal of quartz. And you can see it's got nice flat sides and angles. This is unusual, however. Most of our minerals don't exhibit those nice crystal forms. This means that the mineral had sufficient time and space with which to form, usually inside a cavity. However, all minerals are crystalline. That means that inside there is a regular framework, interlocking crystalline framework for the mineral. The molecules, the atoms, are arranged in a crystalline structure. It doesn't have to be a big crystal in order to be crystalline. The final property that a mineral must possess, it must have a strict set of chemical composition and physical properties. If you are sold a diamond that won't scratch glass, or glass scratches it, you know you don't have a diamond, because diamond is one of the hardest substances known to man. Therefore, glass would easily be scratched by a diamond. If you come across a diamond that doesn't scratch glass, you don't have a diamond. There are a little bit of um, variations in some of these minerals. For example, olivine, with its chemical composition, it can have iron or magnesium that substitutes in the crystalline framework. It's still olivine, but it can have a slightly different composition within a narrow range. So these are our characteristics of minerals. Now, there are over 3,500 types of minerals. 
Fortunately for you and me, we don't have to learn all 3,500 minerals. There are only a few of them that are regular rock makers, especially at the surface of the earth, and even fewer that you will get in your lab kit. In this lab DVD, we'll go through some of the easy ways to identify some of the more common minerals that you will find in the field and also that you may encounter in your lab kit. We use a set of mineral properties to distinguish one mineral from another. Now, color is one of the most obvious things that we look at. We are a very visual species and we tend to describe things to each other in the form of color. However, color is not necessarily a very reliable property. If you look at these rocks, over here, you will see all or quartz, they all have the quartz crystals. Let me move this one so you can see it in the front. This is actually purple quartz. It has the special name of amethyst, but it is quartz. Um, amethyst, February's birthstone, is very, very similar to this which is a nice piece of crystalline quartz. You can see through that one. Here is a milky quartz. has some impurities in it also. And here's another one. Again, this one has some, um, some little crystals, different color, but they're all quartz. So color is not a very reliable property when you're trying to identify minerals. Now, there are some exceptions to that. I'm going to put a couple more over here for you to see. Sulfur is this nice yellow one. I have seen sulfur in a red or orange variety, but that's really unusual. Usually you see it in this nice yellowish mineral. It is rather soft. That's sulfur. And this is one heck of a crystal of something that's commonly known as fool's gold. Its correct mineral name is pyrite. But chances are, if you see something this gold and this shiny, you're looking at pyrite. So although color in general is not a very reliable characteristic, it still can be diagnostic for a couple of mineral specimens. Don't base your entire identification on color, however. It may get you in trouble. Another example, I want to show one more on color before we leave that topic. Here we have some... Let's see, let me arrange that as if I can get it to stand up. There we go. Yeah, these are all pieces of fluorite. We have a nice kind of orangey piece of fluorite. We have this light, almost blue piece of fluorite. And this little column guy, whoops. Uh, we have green and purple. And um, actually, we're topped with pyrite here. But all the rest of this is fluorite. Fluoride is one of those minerals that lab instructors often put on a lab quiz and really confuse the heck out of students because most students will see this nice fractured surface and immediately assume quartz. There's an easy way to tell fluoride and quartz apart, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Fluoride. Okay, well, color is not the best property used, but it can be diagnostic. A much more reliable property is that of streak. And the most famous streak uh, example that I can think of, and one that you may encounter, is that of hematite. Here we have some samples of hematite. We're going to move over here. Okay, we have... Um, this is kind of a blackish, reddish sample. So if we try to describe it with color, we would say, you know, black, kind of blood red. However, when we do a streak of this, note that blood red streak that we get. Okay? Very diagnostic of hematite. Now this is an earthier sample of hematite. They're kind of small pieces, and uh, they'll probably fracture as I try to streak it. If you saw this, as friable as it is, you may say, well, that's not like the hematite I know. However, whoops, might not work for me. It's because I said that. Yeah. Aha! Ah, there we go. 
you can see that it still leaves right here, if we can get that color, it's more of a, a reddish color, the streak of hematite. Now believe it or not, hematite can also be used in jewelry. And this is a cheap necklace, fortunately. <laughs> Let's see if we can get a streak off this one as well too. And again, you get a reddish streak. This one almost looks black with the TV screen, unfortunately. But it is a reddish. Let's see if I can powder it even more. There we go. When I powder it even further, see the reddish streak in it? These are all hematite. This one's a little redder, I think, because it has a higher free iron composition. But notice when I powder, we get red streaks for hematite. Streak is a much more reliable tool to use in color. However, there are some limitations. This streak plate, which you should receive in your lab kit, is simply an unglazed porcelain tile. Now, it works as long as the mineral is not as hard as the tile. Because when we are actually scratching the mineral against the streak plate, we're leaving behind part of the mineral. Kind of the same thing we do when we write with a pencil and we leave part of the graphite behind. Now, if we have a mineral such as quartz, which is harder than our streak plate, no amount of streaking is going to leave a sample of the powdered mineral. Instead, what we'll end up with is some of the powdered streak plate on the mineral. So, streak plates work if you're looking at a mineral with a hardness that is going to be less than about 6.5. Okay, I do have a couple of slides here to also demonstrate some of what we've just seen. For example, those are all quartz again. We have uh, kind of a reddish brown quartz. We have a pale white. We have a black. And we also have a, um, a form of amethyst, the, um, the purple quartz. Streak, here again we see samples of hematite. It's one of those very classic minerals that is identified by its streak. You can see the nice, well, let's see if I can point to it. We have a nice, there we go. This nice shiny sample is called specular hematite. You can actually have this red sample of hematite. The one that fell apart on us was an oolitic hematite. All hematite, all different colors, but it will leave that reddish color when powdered. Okay, what about luster? Now, there are many different types of luster, but for our purpose, we're just going to say metal or not a metal. If something is metallic, it looks typically like a shiny penny. If it's non-metallic, it looks sort of earthy. Let's give a couple of examples there. I'm going to go back to, here we go. Okay, here I have a few minerals arranged out. And if you saw these, whether or not they shine, you could immediately sort them as to whether it was metallic or non-metallic. For example, this one's fairly obvious. It's a very shiny metal. It's called galena. It's a lead sulfide. It's very heavy as well. And we'll talk about density and specific gravity a little bit later. It's a little bit brighter than gunmetal, but very characteristic of galena, very metallic luster. This also has a metallic luster, and if I move it around, you can see that it shines. This is also pyrite. The crystals are there. The crystals are smaller than the big crystal that we first saw, but it is metallic, very metallic luster. Now these other two, on the other hand, this is augite. It's a very um, mafic mineral. It's formed deep in the mantle, uh, where our mafic minerals generally are. And it is a non-metallic. Here we have something that would be classified as earthy, but again, for our purposes, we're going to be looking at non-metallic. This is bauxite. It is the aluminum ore. This is how they mine aluminum. Oxide. So, when you're trying to describe um, minerals luster, metallic or non-metallic will work just fine for this lab. And here are a couple of examples again, just to show you very basic differences. And 
in case you need a, another reminder, our metallic example up at the top over here. This is, um, whoops, this is Galena. Again, this is our lead sulfide. And this is a piece of very non-metallic, although kind of semi-opaque. This is calcite. Metal, non-metal. Okay, so what else can we use besides color, streak, and luster? Again, some minerals do form really nice crystals, although it is rare compared to most of the mineral specimens you will see that simply have crystalline structures. You could see that with a microscope, but their external forms aren't crystalline. Let's go back to this guy. Okay, here we have a couple of nice crystals crystalline substances. Going back to pyrite again, this cubic form, very characteristic of a location in Spain. Quartz, the six-sided quartz crystal, very characteristic of the mineral quartz. This one's a little unusual. Um, it is called dog tooth calcite for a good reason. It does have, um, it looks like little spikes. Dog tooth calcite. Now, Although these crystals are rare, why do we even bother talking about them? The reason we talk about them is because they can be very indicative of what we have as far as a mineral. Crystals can be rare, however, when they do form, they are char characteristic of the mineral because the mineral, if given enough space in which to grow and if given enough time in which to grow, will develop very flat faces and sharp angles the interfacial angles are always constant. Let's go to the PowerPoint for just a bit. And note in this next slide, although we do see some crystalline minerals, the crystals are rare. They grow in open cavities where they can develop into those shapes. But also, look here, different minerals have different shapes. And that's what makes it such a good diagnostic property. Although you may not encounter it often, when you do find a mineral specimen that does have crystals, you can easily, fairly easily, identify the mineral because the mineral will have certain crystalline shapes associated with it. Not all calcite is dog tooth calcite. And not all pyrite grows in those nice little cubes. Pyrite has several different forms, as does calcite. However, even if the crystal is big or small, it's great that the same mineral will have the same angles between these faces. Let's see if I can get in here. Okay, here we go. Uh, note that this is a quartz crystal and note the angles here in the downside. Always 120, whether we have a big or a smaller crystal. We always have the same interfacial angles. So. Even though you might get a specimen that has very small crystals, it would have the same angles between faces that you would see if it were a big crystal. Okay, what about cleavage and fracture? We can get flat faces on minerals not only because the crystals grew that way. We can also see flat faces because of the way that the mineral cleaves or it breaks along regular planes of weakness. For example, here are some samples of, these are all micas. Micas have excellent cleavage in one plane, and you'll note that we're able to pull pieces, sheets, out along this area of weakness. In one plane, the Molecules aren't held together very well, and we're able to break apart. Let's see if I can get a little bit better. There we go. Here we go. This is muscovite mica, or white mica. The other common sheet mica you may run into is this guy. This is biotite, or black mica. Let's see if I can make him cleave as well. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Here's another example of muscovite mica. It doesn't look as white as the first specimen, but then again, it's uh, much thicker. Some of the pioneers actually mined mica and split it along some of these planes of weakness and used it as window panes. 
mica, very characteristic cleavage. Um, some minerals will also cleave whoops, along different planes. Let's go back to the, um, the PowerPoint for just one second. You'll notice that mica is up at the top, kind of cut off there. Um, we can have cleavage at two directions, for example, the potassium feldspars. We can have cleavage in three directions, halite, which is a fancy word for our salt that we use to season our food. We can have cleavage at three directions that aren't at 90 degrees, for example, calcite and dolomite. Um, and we can have even cleavage in four directions, fluorite, diamond is in there too. By the way, when jewelers cut diamonds, they're not using saws to cut the diamonds. They're actually locating the planes of weakness, the cleavage planes, and tapping the diamond just right so that the diamond will cleave along that plane. Cleavage in six directions is common for the mineral sphalerite. Okay, there's another example of mica. Excellent cleavage, but only in one plane. The edges in the other two planes are very jagged. And if you take that big calcite crystal and you hit it with a hammer, you will end up with these nice little cubes of calcite. Okay, let's look at this guy. This is fluorite. Move the mica on. Uh, clean up my mess. There we go. Okay. Here's a fluorite. And this is not a crystal that grew. This is a crystal that was cleaved. Remember fluorite? We also had that beautiful specimen where we had the purple, the green. This one. These are fluorite. Now, if you hit this with a hammer, theoretically, we're supposed to get cleavage in these planes. Now, I don't want to try it with this one. I kind of like that one. Here we have a sample of calcite. Again, we're showing cleavage. And let's try this. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but we'll try. This is actually halite or rock salt. We can tell this because it's salty. Hammer. Don't try this at home. Let's see if we can get it to break. May not. Ha. Ah. Okay. We have cleavage here. This is pretty cool. Let's move this aside. You can see that we definitely hit cleavage plane here. See the nice flat surface here? Here is halite's cleavage. So, if you are really stuck in identifying some of the minerals and you know that it has distinctive cleavage, you can try actually breaking it up with a hammer, though be careful. <laughs> the PowerPoint will now show a couple of other examples. Look at halite. Again, we saw that with the hammer and the halite piece that we had. Calcite, three cleavages, not at 90 though. And there's another piece of fluorite in the photograph that is a piece of purple fluorite, different from the kind of yellow-orange specimen that we saw. Galena also has great cleavage. Um, calcite. Now, Fracture is different from cleavage. Fracture is when a mineral does not have a regular plane upon which it breaks. Instead, what we see is uneven surface. Here we have a picture of a specimen of quartz. And this is fairly characteristic. It looks like broken bottle glass right here. This is conchoidal fracture and very, very typical of quartz. Note that if we bring... If we move the halite aside and we bring this piece of quartz over here, we can see the bottom of the crystal. The crystal was broken off. Let's see if I can get a good angle on that. Very irregular, very broken. Now here's our nice crystalline shape, but here we have very, a very uh, uneven breakage. That would be called fracture. And fracture can be very characteristic of some, of some minerals, such as quartz. Conchoidal fracture. 
diagnostic and quartz. Okay. Now, not all minerals are equal in their hardness. Someone by the name of Friedrich Mohs decided one day that he was going to go ahead and arrange minerals in their order of hardness. He took 10 common minerals that he had, well, maybe not so common, especially when you get to diamond, but he decided to arrange them in order of hardness. This was quite a while back, and before he had very fancy equipment to determine the absolute hardness of a mineral. So what he did, he took a mineral and another mineral to see whether or not it could be scratched by one or the other. Um, here I have a piece of calcite, and here I have a piece of quartz, and if I scratch, I'm breaking off pieces of calcite, not quartz. So that means that the quartz is harder on the Mohs scale than the calcite. Now it's important to remember that the Mohs scale is just a convenient way for us to order a hardness. It's not an absolute scale. That's not to say that a number two on the Mohs scale is twice as hard as a number one, or a diamond at number 10 is not 10 times as hard as number one talc. Now, of course, when you're out in the field, you're not going to go ahead and have the instrumentation needed to determine the absolute hardness of a mineral. Or even at home, when you get your mineral set, you can't figure out the exact hardness on some of these minerals. But there are some easy tests and techniques you can use to try to figure out what you have. Let's look at a few of these. Here we have a couple of specimens. This is talc. It's very, very soft. Let's see there. Look at the powder in the air. <laughs> I'm scratching it with my fingernail. Again, very, very soft, so we're able to quickly scratch and break apart with our fingernail. And that's because when we look at a hardness, an absolute hardness, our fingernail is about a 2.5, and talc is number one. Okay. Now, let's go back to this for just a second. Let's see. Here we go. Here we have a piece of, a very well-used piece of gypsum. This is the stuff that's very common in sheetrock. And you notice that on the Mohs scale, it has a hardness of 2. And sure enough, I'm able to scratch off pieces of gypsum. So, if you're able to scratch something with your fingernail, and that's a regular fingernail, not some of these super nails that you... Uh, may apply, but if you can scratch a mineral with a fingernail, you're looking at a hardness under 2.5. Now, let's go back to fluorite for a minute. Remember fluorite? Here we go. All of these pretty specimens of fluorite. Now, when you see fluorite in these beautiful colors, green and purple, and here we have kind of an orangey, kind of a light blue, you would think, wouldn't that make a great mineral for use in jewelry. Well, there's a problem because fluorite is not very hard. Let's see if I can do this. I'm going to take a nail, regular old nail, and you can see that I am scratching up that fluorite. There's the pattern. Let's do that again. Fluorite comes in at number four on the Mohs scale. Now, if you can scratch something with a nail, you're looking at about 4.5, sometimes 5.5, depending on what kind of nail you have. So, anything that can be scratched with a nail is at least a softness of below 4, 4.5. Okay, what about those minerals that we can't scratch? For example, these are all feldspars. Move these away. These are all samples of feldspars. They're different colors, but they are harder than what we've seen with our talc and our our gypsum. Actually, I'm going to make sure all of the powder disappears here from our former samples. And you can see that if anything's flaking, it's going to be my fingernail at this point. It's definitely, I'm ruining my fingernail. It's definitely not the mineral itself. Okay. And let's go back to this scale. Well, actually, no, let's keep this slide. I'm sorry. If we look, number six, orthoclase felspar, 
On the Mohs scale, we see that this is fairly hard stuff. So even if we use a nail, unless we have a, a special surgical steel, um, chances are we're not going to be able to scratch the feldspar. So we can also identify the minerals through the Mohs scale by what we can't scratch. Remember a streak plate is 6.5, so if a uh, mineral does not leave behind a streak but part of the plate ends up on your mineral, you're looking at a mineral that is harder than 6.5. Other soft minerals, here we have graphite, and I'm going to make a mess on this one. Graphite, of course, is the mineral that is used in our pencils. And the reason it works is because it is so soft that we're able to take it and actually leave behind part of our pencil when we write. Very soft. Calcite is a three. Occasionally uh, you can scratch calcite, occasionally not. Um, depends on how your fingernail interacts with that mineral. I've actually scratched some calcite. I'm not sure if, I don't think I have hard fingernails. But um, it is a softer mineral and you can definitely scratch it with a nail. A penny can also be a good diagnostic tool. Ah, have a penny. And here's a piece of calcite. This one's pretty well scratched up, but let's try it. Let's find out maybe this spot here. So the penny at 3.5 is harder than the calcite at 3. And we're able to break off pieces of that calcite with the penny. Okay, so we've talked about color. We've talked about streak. We've talked about luster, um, crystal form, hardness. What other tests can we use? Specific gravity is one that can be used out in the field, but not in an analytical way. We're not going to measure the exact mass of the rock or mineral and the exact volume and then divide the mass by the volume. Instead, out in the field, we tend to heft the minerals. The way we do that, pretty much an equal size mineral and another equal size different mineral will have a different heft. This is something called barite. It is very heavy. Powdered barite is used as a weighting fluid. It has a high density, which means that it has a lot of mass per unit volume. Here's a piece of talc on the other hand, and when I have this, it's very light. So, barite, talc. Barite, otherwise, is pretty nondescript. The identifying characteristic in barite, if you run across the specimen, is going to be its heft. Very dense. Its specific gravity, again, when we compare that to water, specific gravity is a unitless number, and it is compared to the density of water, the specific gravity of barite is, is high and it will feel heavier than an equal sized mineral or rock, usually. We can also use some special properties and although I will give you some tips on how to identify any minerals you may find in your collection in a nice ordered way, a lot of times geologists will go straight for those, spe those special properties simply because they are very, very diagnostic. For example, feel. You can tell some minerals by their feel. This is another piece of graphite, not as powdery as the one you just saw, but it still writes nonetheless. Graphite feels greasy. It's got a very greasy feel to it. And halite, salt, can also feel pretty greasy. Usually that's in areas with high humidity. It's hygroscopic. So the feel of certain minerals can be a diagnostic, if not identification, at least a good tip on what you may have in your mineral set. Other special properties you can use, for example, reaction with acid. Some minerals, such as calcite, and if you have dolomite, which is a calcium-magnesium carbonate, will fizz with acid. Dolomite, you will sometimes have to powder that down in order to get a fizz with acid. It's not as readily effervescent as calcite is. 
Calcite readily fit, uh, fizzes with dilute HCl. Let's look at that. Here we have a specimen of calcite. And this is dilute HCl. It's 0.1 molar. It um, won't hurt you other than maybe eat your clothes. Let's see if we can get it to effervesce, especially on this powdered surface. Ah, can we see bubbles? Here we go. Now the black that you see on the rock is actually from the degradation of my eyedropper. <laughs> but the acid and the carbonate rock react and that fizz you see is actually carbon dioxide gas being released in the chemical reaction. So a very easy diagnostic test for calcite is to use a very dilute solution of hydrochloric acid. Again, this is 0.1 molar. You don't need anything much stronger than that because you will get a good effervescence with very dilute HCl. If you have dolomite, if you powder the sample, you'll get effervescence as well. What other special properties? Well, taste. And yes, I have been known to taste my rocks. Well, I'm kind of, I'm very careful about which rocks I taste. But if you're in doubt, and if your grade absolutely depends on it in class, I've been known to, yes, it's salty. It's halite. I taste rocks. This one actually can look like halite at times, but it is called sylvite. Instead of NaCl, halite, we have KCl. And it doesn't taste nearly as nice. KCl, sylvite, is used as salt substitute. It's got a pretty bitter taste. So if you're ever in doubt whether you have NaCl or KCl, halite, sylvite, you can taste your rocks. I hear that some rocks, such as glauconite, which is a green mineral, um, taste as what they are. Glauconite is fossilized fish poop and supposedly it tastes pretty bad. That one I haven't tried and I don't think I'm going to. Okay, some minerals also are diagnostic because they are magnetic. And we'll look at that one next. Let's see. This guy, pretty nondescript, you're not sure. Now, is it a pyroxene? Is it an amphibole? It looks dark. It looks mafic. What is it? If you take out a magnet and the magnet sticks, chances are you have magnetite because the rock has magnetic properties. If we try that with our barite sample, for example, no, will not pick up the magnet. Magnetite will. So an easy special property that you can use to readily identify magnetite. Okay, I have a couple of slides that also demonstrate some of these properties, perhaps in a little bit bigger format. Again, halite doesn't always come in that nice cleavage pattern that you see over here on your left. But if you taste it, it does taste like salt. Here's an example of calcite. Adding HCl will definitely give you that effervescent fizz. Magnetite, here we go, it's magnetic. You can definitely stick a magnet to it. Another property of calcite, if you don't have any acid around and you do have a clear specimen, you can see double refraction. Calcite also has another special property. Now, we can't always use all of these properties out in the field. If you're out in the field, on a field course, you can definitely carry your streak plate you can look at color, you can look at luster, you can look at crystal form. Um, I do bring my acid out, acid out in the field. And you can check hardness if you have fingernail, penny, and nail. Some of the other properties you may use to identify minerals are better done back in the lab, especially with the microscope. For example, here is a thin section of a rock underneath polarized light. And you can see some very distinguished characteristics of the minerals that compose that rock. That is going to, this is a sample of biotite in normal light. And then when we polarize the light with a polarizing microscope, this is what we see. So let's go back. Very diagnostic of biotite. So there are additional techniques that geologists can use back in the lab. 
Another uh, slide showing, this is microcline, it's a felspar, very diagnostic twinning. Okay, so you have a packet of minerals that have just arrived. How do you go about dividing them up? Number one, basic thing you should do, figure out which one's metallic and which one's non-metallic. Again, that's the luster. For your metallic minerals, try to determine the hardness. Use your fingernail, a penny, a nail, a streak plate. Determine the streak of the minerals. If you have that reddish brown streak or blood red streak, chances are you might have hematite. Take a look again. Any other properties, including any crystals that might be present, the cleavage, the fracture, special properties such as magnetism, take a look at those. Well, what about those non-metallic minerals? Again, determine the hardness, determine the cleavage, whether or not they have any regular planes upon which they've been broken. And then, again, look at other special properties, maybe reaction to acid, effervescence, specific gravity, how, how heavy is it compared to its size? What is its density compared to other rocks? Color can also be used to aid in identification, but as we've mentioned, it's not necessarily the best property to use. Good luck. If you have any questions in identifying your minerals, please feel free to email your instructor. He or she will be very happy to help you and answer any of your questions. Thank you for joining me. Goodbye. <laughs>